Hi, welcome back. I'm a skeptic when it comes to technical indicators, price patterns, charts, volume indicators, but that doesn't mean they don't work. Now, there are people out there who are very good at using them to seemingly detect what will happen to stock prices in the future. So setting aside skepticism for the moment, I'd like to look at the indicators that get used out there and look at the basis or try to categorize them at least on why the people who use them may think they work. So let's set the table. When you th look at the foundations of technical analysis, it's straightforward. It, a, a technical analyst or people who believe in technical analysis believe that price is set by demand and supply. Who disagree with that? They'd also argue that supply and demand is set by new uh, individually, set by lots of factors, some rational and some irrational, and that markets continually weigh all these factors. That again is beyond questioning. I think everybody would agree that there are factors, rational and irrational, that drive supply and demand. The third assumption is what sets technical analysis apart from the random walkers. Technical analysts believe that stock prices tend to move in trends which persist for periods of time. A random walk walker, on the other hand, doesn't believe that. But that's the basis for technical analysis. And finally, and this I think is, is a key part of technical analysis, that, that the key to making money is not just understanding demand and supply, but getting ahead of shifts in demand and supply. That technical indicators can allow you to detect those shifts before they happen. That again, that is I think the, the driver of value creation in technical analysis. So here's what I'd like to do. There are hundreds and hundreds of technical indicators out there. I don't know, I'm, I'm not even familiar with many of them. But I'd like to start putting the technical indicators that I'm familiar with into buckets. And as you start seeing other technical indicators, I think it's well worth the effort of putting them into buckets. What am I talking about? Every set of technical indicators is built on some presumption of market irrationality. That market irrationality is what you're trying to exploit with that technical indicator. And might as well be open about what your behavior, what behavioral component you're building on with the technical indicator. So let's cut to the chase. Here's the first one. There is substantial evidence and a lot of people who believe that markets overreact. They overreact to good news and they overreact to bad news. And this is backed up both, both by psychological studies and behavioral finance research in markets. So let's say you believe that markets do overreact. And the evidence you showed or pointed up is when you see extreme movements in stock prices, you often see movements back in the other direction. If you remember the last session or two sessions ago, we talked about the negative serial correlation in very long period returns. And the bigger the drop or the increase in stock prices, the bigger the, the reversal seems to be. Of course, the skeptic might say if that's in fact the case that, that markets uh, no overreact, why are there more contrarian investors out there and why aren't they able to push the price back quickly? Why is there a drift in the price? Okay. And if if in fact there's overreaction, is it, uh, is it more prevalent with some kinds of information than others? Is it, for instance, more likely with an acquisition announcement than with an earnings announcement, or are there no differences? So that's what technical the first set of technical indicators look at, is ways to take advantage of market overreaction. And here are three examples. There is a measure called the odd lot trading measure. Basically, you look at, uh, uh, before brokerage houses, uh, before online brokerage um, became became par for the course, if you went through a traditional broker, there was a big deal made about whether you bought an even lot or an odd lot. Even lots are lots of 100 shares apiece. Odd lots are shares of 35, 40, 55 shares. If you assume that odd lots are bought by small individual investors, and you further assume that individual, those small individual investors are more prone to overreacting. And these are assumptions. I'm not, I'm not agreeing with any of these statements. Then here's what you could do. You could look for a jump in odd lot trading and argue that if there's a lot of odd lot buying of a stock, that you should be selling that stock because those odd lot traders, after all, are more likely to get over enthused about good news and sell Know, and buy too much after good news and sell too much after bad news. So odd lot trading becomes a kind of stand-in for the man on the street, the individual investor, and with the assumption that that investor is more likely to be the overreactor. The second actually moves up the spectrum. It looks at cash positions at mutual funds. 
equity mutual funds. If you look at equity mutual funds, in theory, these, mu these mutual funds tell you that they're going to invest all the money they get from you in stocks. But in practice, they don't. Most of them hold some of the money you send them in cash. Why do they do it? Partly for, you know, partly because they can't have everything invested all the time, but also because they are, they, t they take market timing positions. In other words, if they're bullish about markets, they will try to get you cash into the market right away. If they're bearish, they will actually hold the money as cash. So here's a second, or a second technical trading rule that's a contrarian rule. You look at the mutual fund cash positions. If the mutual fund cash position is high, that means mutual funds are, are, are collectively bearish, right? You do the exact opposite. If mutual funds are bearish, you think that, that you basically go out and buy stocks. If mutual funds are bullish, you go out and sell stocks. Again, effectively you're saying mutual funds are my stand-in for the typical investor. They're far more likely to be overreacting, to be doing the wrong thing. I'm going to do the exact opposite. And here's the third technical trading rule that's built on contrarian investing. Investment, there are investment advisors out there who put out newsletters. And there are, study, there are actually surveys that look at the bullish and bearish proportions among investment advisors. So here again, here's what you do. You look at the percentage of investment advisors who are bullish. If that number is really high, you sell stocks. Why? Because most investors are bullish, and you assume that investors overreact then they're being bullish for the wrong reasons. So you sell when they're buying and buy when they're selling. But in all three, what you're trying to do is get a stand-in for the typical investor and go against the typical investor, contrarian technical trading rules. Here's the second set of technical indicators I want to look at. The second set of technical indicators try to detect shifts in demand and supply before they happen. So for instance, um, there, are, there are people who look at normalized P ratios. What is that? Basically, they look at the average earnings over time and look at what multiple of earnings stocks are trading at right now. Here's the rule they use. If stocks are trading at a much higher multiple of earnings than the historic norm, that, that smooth dot line that you see in there, is there, then they're overpriced. If they sell below, they're underpriced. Again, you are trying to detect shifts in demand and supply using some fundamental indicator, something that you can point to and say, hey, that tells me that, that something is going to change here. So here are measures of technical indicators, right? Essentially, uh, you could look at the breadth of the market. What is the breadth of the market? It's the number of stocks that advance on any given period, a day, a week, a month, relative to the number of stocks that decline. So the higher the number of stocks that go up relative to the number the broader the market. How is that used? If you have an up movement in the market that is not accompanied by breadth, in other words, markets have the, the overall index goes up, but it's being caused by a few stocks jumping in price rather than a bun, uh, uh, the vast proportion of stocks going up, that is less bullish than a price increase that's accompanied by a broad market. Similarly, a drop in the market that's caused by just three or four stocks is less dangerous than one that's caused by 70% of stocks dropping at about the same time. The second is support and resistance lines. You hear talk of this all the time from charters. A stock that's at 2850, 29, 29, 25 goes through the $30 mark, which is viewed as a major resistance line. That's viewed as a bullish sign that you've gone through a resistance line. On the other hand, if you have a stock that's dropped in price from 31 to 27 to 25 to 23, but it stayed above 20 for a long time, but then it drops below 20, the fact that it dropped below that $20, the support line is viewed as a bearish indicator. Again, it, 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 the assumption here is when you go through a, a resistance line or drop through a support line, something happens in the market and demand supply lines shift. So when you go, through, go below that $20, you know, support line, effectively you see a whole bunch of selling supposedly coming into the market, causing the stock to go down even more. Moving averages have been a favored device for people who want to detect shifts in demand and supply, where the argument again is if a stock moves above a moving average for over the last 52 weeks, 26 weeks, and different, different charters use different indicators, that is viewed as a bullish sign or a bearish sign depending on whether the stock moves above a moving average line or below a moving average line. And finally, shifts in volume are often also used in conjunction with price indicators as measures of are we seeing a shift in demand and supply. A sudden surge in volume is often viewed as a sign that something is changing under the surface even if prices are not changing. 
So the first set of indicators are contrarian indicators. You're looking for ways to go against what the typical investor, whether it's a mutual fund, an individual investor, or, uh, or a newsletter writer is, is thinking. The second set of indicators are indicators that try to, to, to get ahead of demand and supply, shifts in demand and supply. The third set of indicators build on something we talked about a couple of sessions before, which is the force of momentum. Markets of momentum. When stocks go up, they tend to keep going up. When stocks go down, they tend to keep going down. And the evidence, as we saw, is fairly strong, at least over certain time periods, one-year periods, six-month time periods. They get weaker as you go to longer time periods. If you believe there's market momentum, then you're going to be looking for momentum indicators. One of the oldest and most widely used momentum indicators is called relative strength. Sounds fancy, but here's what you do. You take the price now, you divide by the price six months ago. So stocks that have gone up the most will have the highest relative strength. So if you're a believer in momentum, you're going to go with the stocks that have the highest relative strength, and you sell those stocks which have the most, the lowest relative strength, where the price has gone down relative to the historical price. You can also use trend lines, where essentially you try to fit lines through graphs, and you see how your stock is behaving relative to a trend line. And if you notice a trend line that's upward sloping, that's, sign of, that's a sign of momentum. So even if the stock is zigzags, if there's a positive trend line, it's viewed as a sign of momentum. That's good news. Whereas the trend line, trend line is downward sloping, it's bad news. So essentially, again, you're looking for measures that will let you detect when there's momentum in a stock and ride that momentum. The hidden weapon or the secret weapon for many analysts has become trading volume, which in conjunction with momentum might give you even more information. So if you look at stocks which have price momentum and high trading volume, it looks like they're even better momentum picks than stocks with high price momentum but low trading volume. So by combining price and volume, you might actually be able to get much more potent technical indicators. And one of the nice things about the last 20 years is the data that is available in volume has become much richer. You can do things with trading volume you could not have done two decades ago or three decades ago. The fourth group of uh, technical indicators, you look for somebody that you believe is smarter than you are, somebody who's a guru investor, somebody who can lead the way, somebody who knows more than you do, and you try to do what they're doing. Here are a couple of examples of smart investor indicators. One is specialists on the New York Stock Exchange are people on the floor who supposedly know more than you or I about demand and supply and this stuff. So in fact, there's an indicator called specialist short sales where you can see which stocks specialists are selling short on and how much. So essentially, if, if you buy into the notion that experts know more than you do and specialists are your experts, if they're selling short, you're going to sell as well. So if there's, so specialist short sales becomes an indicator as to when you should be getting out of the market. You could also look at insiders and companies. Insiders, of course, are defined by the SEC to include not just managers, but directors and and people who hold more than 5% of the stock. Now, your argument might be that those insiders know a great deal more about the company than you do, and you'd probably be right. So if you could track what they're doing by looking at what they're buying or selling, then you might Try, then you might do the same. So if they're buying, you'd buy. The only problem is the only data we have on insider buying and selling comes from the filings that insiders make with the SEC, but those filings almost by definition cannot be based on information because that would be Ill illegal insider trading. So the problem with using the, in, the, 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 the ins insider buying and selling that you get from the SEC filings is you're getting a subset of insiders who are legal insiders. What you'd really like to get your hands on is those illegal insider buying and selling, but that, of course, is difficult to do, though you could track trading volume. Maybe you can get ahead of the game. So that's a fourth factor, which brings me to the fifth and final set of technical indicators, and these make me a little queasy, because these are the indicators that argue that markets are driven by mystical forces that cause prices to move in certain ways over very long time periods. So for instance, you have the Elliott wave, which actually looks at waves and markets and it, it breaks them down into, into various sizes and it tells you where in a wave you are. It's an amazing and intricate process. I have no idea what, what underlies the process other than the fact that it seems to be suggesting that history, that, that historical wave is a much stronger factor than any fundamentals. You got the Dow theory, which also argues that markets have these big movements over time and those movements happen no matter what the fundamentals are. 
and from here you also have less less well-known waves and cycles that drive markets but to the extent that you do believe that markets are governed by the by the stars and by external forces you might in fact decide to use those technical indicators so as i said this is just a small subset of those technical indicators out there and I don't begrudge those people who feel that these technical indicators give them a leg up in investing. If you in fact decide to go down this route and use technical indicators, here are some of the suggestions I would have. First is be very clear on the behavioral basis for why you think a technical indicator works. In other words, don't just use a technical indicator because it looks good on paper or has delivered returns in the past. Step back and ask, what is it I'm assuming about market behavior that would lead me to believe that this indicator is going to let me get ahead of the game? Second, when somebody says a technical indicator works, don't take them at their word. Verify, test it out, see if it in fact worked. We, we've talked a few sessions ago about how to test any kind of market indicator, beat the market scheme. Technical indicators should be put to the same test. Third, if you're going to use a technical indicator to trade, you, you almost always have to trade quickly, which means your costs will be higher. You have to make sure that you keep that balance right, that you, that you trade quickly enough without letting your costs get out of control. And here's the follow-up. Most technical trading rules, even ones with, that work, require that your holding period be, f be, be just set right. I call this the Goldilocks phenomenon, which means if you, in some, some technical indicators, if you hold the stock for two weeks, you make money, but if you hold it for four and a half, you lose money. So you've got to be very disciplined about figuring out what those right time, or time horizons are and sticking with them. And finally, and this was related to the timely trading, you've got to control trading costs because the nature of technical indicators is you will trade a lot more than everybody else. And we've talked about trading costs and not just in terms of brokerage costs, but in terms of price impact, in terms of bid-ask spreads, and also in terms of the taxes, tax costs they create for you. you got to make sure the returns you make from your trading strategy exceed all those costs. So in summary, there are lots and lots of technical indicators out there. Some of them actually work, but if you find a technical indicator that works, dig deeper. Look to see what kind of behavioral assumption underlies that indicator and be comfortable with that. Are you willing to characterize the market the way that indicator characterizes the market? But I wish you the very best with your next technical indicator in, and incorporating it into your investment strategy. Thank you for listening.